Welcome back to the Automation Podcast. My name is Sean Tierney from Insights and Automation. And this week on the show, I meet up with Stephen Griggs and Todd Rigby of Ragent to learn all about their mesh networking products designed for industrial applications. Todd and Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the Automation Podcast. I'm really looking forward to learning about your company and technology. But before we jump into that, could you take a moment to introduce yourself to our audience? Well, thank you very much for having us, Sean. Uh, we're appreciative of uh, you giving us up some of your programming time to talk about Ragent. My name's Todd Rigby. I'm the director of sales for Ragent, and I've been with the company for uh, nearly 12 years. And uh, Stephen, my colleague, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, I'm Stephen Griggs. Um, I'm the Vice President of Sales and Engineering for Ragent Globally. Um, I have been with the company now for 16 years. So kind of when right before we got started into um, all of the mining market and pursuant to all the other markets that we've been in now for quite some time. Um, love the technology. Um, it's a uh, it's just the, the the reason that I have uh, really made it my career to to to, to be at Ragent is because of the uniqueness uh, that Ragent brings to the table. Uh, some of which Todd's seen personally first as a customer and now as a sales guy. Todd was actually our very very first dealer uh, before he came to Ragent, so he knows he knows a lot about what we've he knows a lot of our history and and what we've been doing for so long. Um, Todd and I currently we do we do a lot of work together, and Todd's got this really great presentation uh, to show you guys. So um, he's going to share that with everybody. Well, let me tell you a bit about Ragen. We are a wireless networking company. We provide private wireless broadband networks for mission critical applications. Um, specifically, the types of networks that we provide are mesh networks. A mesh network is a uh, ad hoc network where any node can talk to any other node. Um, Ragent's been in business since 2002. We started shortly after 9-11. Um, coincidentally, uh, we responded to a government tender of sorts who was looking for a rapidly deployable self-healing uh, network that could be deployed after uh, catastrophic events such as 9-11 uh, to provide uh, mission critical communications. So we, anybody who was uh, watching the news may recall uh, how disruptive the uh, events of 9-11 were on the first responder community because all communications in lower Manhattan were essentially taken out. Uh, by the downing of the Twin Towers. And so that's kind of raging shtick. We build IP networks, uh, specifically layer two IP networks that can transmit voice, video, or data um, across our network. Ragent's involved in a number of industry verticals, uh, basically verticals where we're providing our customers rather are providing the infrastructure for the country and the world to operate um, with things that people take for granted every day, like uh, water coming out of the tap or electricity powering light bulbs when you flip the light switch um, and uh, manufacturing having all of the minerals uh, that are necessary to produce the goods that we consume on a regular basis. It, for the audio, I'm just going to jump in here for a second. For the audio only audience, some of these applications you guys will be really familiar with, like mining, like oil and gas, like petrochemical, like, um, you know, ag agriculture, like, uh, you know, so many of these things, warehouse automation. You know, maybe a lot of us aren't involved in theme parks or entertainment or construction or the military, but those other categories are definitely places where. We're very where we know we have automation there. We have PLCs there. We have VFDs there. So I just wanted to jump in because I know the audio audience can't see all the images. This is a beautiful slide, by the way. But I did want to throw that out there to kind of give the audio audience 
a little bit more of where you guys use your products. And I'll throw it back to you, Todd. Well, I appreciate that, Sean. And, you know, I should note that I would say 90 plus percentage of the network deployments that we're involved with utilize uh, control and automation in some form or fashion as part of their operations. Throw something in here real quick, Todd. Yeah, um, absolutely. One of the things that I don't want to detract from is uh, the fact that uh, the new and upcoming uh, um, efforts in automation using drones and robots. So that's uh, that's become kind of a key part of uh, of our deployments now. Everybody uses or everybody's starting to use drones, but in the warehouse automation field and in some of the manufacturing fields, they're using a lot of robots. And we go right on those devices as well to provide connectivity to those machines um, for rolling video, et cetera, et cetera. So drones and robots, I believe, is is, is something that um, is kind of unique for us as well. Yeah, we cover a lot of robotics on our morning show. Um, it's just becoming a huge part of automation, integrating them with, um, you know, the, the control systems of PLCs, the HMIs and the SCADA systems. It's just a huge growth area for us. I, I am looking forward for an excuse to buy a drone, but I have not yet had a reason to hook up a PLC to a drone yet, but I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> Fortunately, I was just able to buy my team a couple of drones uh, for survey purposes, actually. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, who doesn't like to fly a drone? They're awesome. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, Stephen brings up an interesting point when he talks about drones and robots. One of the challenges in providing reliable communications to drones and robots is the mobility aspect. And that's one of the foundational, I'd call it competitive advantages that Ragent provides to our customers is continuous connectivity to moving assets whether that moving asset is a 450 ton haul truck in an open pit mine, or whether it's an AGV in a warehouse or a drone flying indoors, outdoors, underground somewhere, and keeping that connected as it moves over, uh, you know, possibly large distances, um, not just measured in feet, but measured in miles. That's, kind of a uh, well within Ragent's wheelhouse. Now, isn't that one of the benefits of a mesh network? Because like if you have an antenna in warehouse A and an antenna in warehouse B and an antenna in warehouse C, as your devices move between them, there's usually dropouts. And uh, but with is it true that like with a mesh network that eliminates those dropouts that you're connected all the time? You don't have to worry about the those type of, uh, you know, switching over from one antenna to another. So, yeah, that's actually, um, you know, Todd says that's one of our strengths. Actually, mobility is is uh, kind of Ragent's bread and butter. That's, uh, we do mobility more than anybody does, or more, but better than anybody does, I'll say. Um, because um, in this particular mesh network, uh, you have radios, you, we have, first of all, we have multiple radios in our nodes, and each of those nodes can maintain connectivity on each of its multiple interfaces. So uh, multiple radio interfaces can talk to multiple radio interfaces. Um, and there is no, the the, the, um, uh, the thing you're talking about there, Sean, is what we call handoff. There's no real handoff uh, because you're, we're not moving from access point. We don't have that client to access point kind of relationship. Uh, so we don't have to wait for a, a client like you know your cell phone or something uh, to disconnect from one access point and then connect to another one. We don't have that handoff problem. To maybe go in just a, a smidgen deeper, with traditional Wi-Fi, the client is only able to maintain one active, one connection at a time, and it has to drop that connection before it can make a connection to the next access point. Um, and so you have this momentary loss on a good day. You have multiple moments of loss on a bad day. Um, when you're dealing with LTE, um, LTE is a bit more sophisticated than traditional Wi-Fi in that the client can monitor many connections, but it only has one active connection. So it has a much more elegant handoff, but there still can be latency associated with that, um, especially when you're dealing with IIoT and 
control and automation. Uh, Ragent, because we have these many active connections from our radio interfaces to many other uh, radio interfaces in node in other nodes, um, we operate more like a switch moving data from one port to the other. Um, we are a layer two network, just like a switch is a layer two device. And uh, so you have many active uh, links that you're able to transmit data over. And we our protocol allows uh, selection of different links on a packet by packet basis. So it's always looking for the best route and it does not have to disconnect or reconnect or uh, as compared to LTE, it doesn't have to uh, suspend activity on one connection to transfer ac activity and make another connection active uh, before it can transmit. We literally can just change, uh, you know, packets can be streaming across one link and between two packets, now it's streaming across a different link to a different transceiver in a different node to give you that continuous connectivity, even while you're mobile, even while uh, the assets are being mobile at high speed. So, um, you know, if, uh, you think of an AGV in a warehouse that might be traveling two to five miles an hour, we wouldn't consider that high speed. We would consider 100 plus miles an hour high speed and we're able to maintain continuous connectivity in that kind of an environment. For your um, for your audio only listeners, um, think about um, a distributed wireless layer two switch. So that's kind of what this, you know, when you bring all these nodes together, that's essentially what you have, is a distributed wireless layer two switch. By the way, that was a great explanation. Thank you very much. I want to move on to uh, a couple uh, use case pictures. So what I'm displaying here is a diagram of a city environment where we have nodes distributed on towers, on buildings, on moving vehicles, as I think there's a drone in there. And all of these devices can interact with one another and transfer data around. Um, we've also got devices on buses and police cars. Um, you can kind of think of building a Ragent network kind of like building a network out of Legos. Um, you use our nodes, which we call breadcrumbs, to put them where either where you want to have visibility and coverage or where you want to have connectivity to end devices also. Now, the end device could be a... Uh, a LAN or a WAN connection, but an end device could also be uh, a laptop in, say, a policeman's cruiser so he can track and look up license plate numbers um, while he's driving around in an urban environment. You know, this picture kind of reminds me of a story we, we recently covered in the morning news where utilities were putting in their own private LTE networks. Would something like this work for like a utility that has like, um, let's just say like a wastewater plant that has like, you know, lift stations all over the place, all over the town. And, you know, they have a, a main facility with which is very busy, but they have some really distant uh, devices. Would this be something that they could use? Absolutely. And we we have done that before with water utilities where they uh, connected all of their pump stations and lift stations uh, back to their main office. Um, they were able to have redundant connections between every one of those locations. They were connected to at least three or four other locations. So if you had an event where one of your nodes went down, then you only had that one site that was offline. It didn't cripple the whole network. Uh, in utilities, there's a lot of security concerns with uh, bad actors hacking into the network. Um, you know, a few months ago, or maybe it was uh, late last year, there was a report of a major water utility that had been hacked. 
and the uh, person who hacked in programmed the system to dump uh, extraordinary amounts of chlorine into the uh, drinking water that would have, you know, made thousands and thousands of people sick or uh, perhaps even loss of life. Luckily, an employee was able to catch that and delete that instruction out of their processing system. Um, our our customer that used Ragent in their water utility, the computer in the office is connected into the network where all their facilities are interconnected, but they don't have that computer connected uh, to the internet. There's no physical way to get from the internet into their private secure network that runs their um, their water pump stations or their sewage lift stations. They can operate that completely independent of the internet uh, with the safety and security of Ragent's mil-spec security features that are built into our network that uh, they can rest assured that wirelessly they're not going to get hacked and they don't have a connection to the internet so they can't get hacked that way. Well, that's I wanted to ask you about that too because we hear a lot of people that the drive up hackers who hack wirelessly. And so you said something that was very interested to me and I apologize if I'm pulling this ahead in the presentation, but I wanna know more about this mil spec type of security you have built in this. So no wireless hackers are gonna be able to jump on the private network. So um, one of the unique things about our protocol is the fact that uh, the mesh links are proprietary. So we use a, our proprietary protocol for that. Um, I was actually working with a customer in oil and gas um, who is, they're very, very sensitive to um, their data security. It's something that, uh, in, in fact, they hire um, companies to come in and try to hack and try to infiltrate the network. Um, after we deployed, uh, they had such a, they had, they had a, they had a team come in um, and they tried to start gathering information and started trying to infiltrate um, just on itself, just by itself. Um, because they have no, they had at this particular um, customer, they weren't using uh, regular Wi-Fi clients, like because our, our radios are capable of both meshing and servicing wireless 802.11, you know, Wi-Fi clients. Um, they didn't have any access points on um, to service Wi-Fi clients. They just had the mesh links going, and uh, the um, uh, team that that attempted to to hack them um, could not decipher any of the data that was moving back and forth, first of all. Um, second of all, uh, they weren't able to, um, they weren't able to even inject packets. Um, so they weren't able to do any, they weren't able to, to decipher anything to do a, like a max spoofing kind of attack. They weren't able to inject packets uh, or try to do a denial of service that none of that was even possible before we even engaged um, the, the, the mill standard security that we do have for our uh, our mesh links because we have everything up to you know AES 256 um, when it comes to the the mesh link encryption um, and then we also have some proprietary encryption uh, we have our own um, team that works on uh, nothing but security and encryption um, uh, to the end that we now actually employ uh, for those that are worried about encryption and throughput we actually have a device an offline or an, I'm sorry, an inline encryptor as well. So those those listeners of yours who are maybe ex-military or comms people or whatever, we do we do inline encryption as well um, without a hit in in throughput. So there's some very um, develop. There's a lot of development in in our security protocols. So another use case I wanted to show you is open pit mining. Uh, Ragent has over 300 of uh, some of the largest open pit mines around the world utilizing uh, our network for their live communications. People may think having big heavy equipment digging in the dirt is a very low tech industry. And I would uh, let you know that it's actually extremely high tech. And frankly, most of the equipment and vehicles that operate in open pit mines today are connected, um, and if they're using a raging network, they're connected continuously as they move about 
and operate in the mine, um, getting directions about where to go pick up a load, where to go drop off a load, pulling uh, data about health metrics of the machines. Um, this equipment represents the largest asset of a mining company and therefore taking care of it and making sure it's operating optimally um, has a huge impact on their bottom line. Um, additionally, there's applications uh, specifically directed at safety where uh, you know there's cameras on board monitoring how long the operator blinks and uh, can employ different tactics from vibrating the seat to uh, sounding an alarm to help wake them up. Um, but it also then sends those clips of them snoozing to uh, to the the dispatchers that sit up in the control rooms um, so that they can intervene and maybe give that person a break to ensure that uh, there are no accidents. Um, mining is an extremely safety conscious industry and uh, Ragent's able to provide support for these many, many different applications that are running simultaneous in uh, a mine uh, to help them be more productive and efficient. You know, as I'm looking at this picture, uh, you know, and I know the audio audience can't see this, but I'm thinking every vehicle that has one of these um, devices on it not only can communicate back to the headquarters, but it can also be a relay station, can it? Yes, that's exactly right. And it, uh, one of the things, you know, when Todd was talking about the, you know, the, the technology or, you know, how it could be perceived that, that mining's low tech, uh, just imagine that each one of those, you know, 400 ton haul trucks have each one of them have hundreds of sensors. And um, each one of those sensors is tied into a central system that, that is uploading that vehicle's particular health all the way back up to, you know, somebody who can make sense out of all of that data, but they can, uh, they can preemptively, you know, stop a truck and bring it in for service before they have a catastrophic failure, because a catastrophic failure on these trucks means, you know, a $2 million engine or something like that, you know? So they're really, you know, these networks, you know, with the amount of money they save in maintenance and things like that, pay for themselves within the first year that they own them. So there's a you lot know, of return on investment. Sean, you brought up a great point that within a raging kinetic mesh network, we do support machine to machine connectivity, as well as machine to infrastructure and infrastructure to infrastructure. So you have, uh, you know, lots of opportunities for interconnectedness. Um, sounds like a made up word, but in reality, that's what's going on. You know, I wanted to ask a question here. Um, I noticed that on the buildings and on the towers, we have this, it looks like a red or orange device. Then on the, the vehicles, it seems like we have this blue device. And then the people is like this green device. Can you tell me what the difference is? Like, what, what is that key telling us? So we have different models of breadcrumbs. All of our breadcrumb models run the same firmware. And they're all, they can all interoperate together. So we can, you know, earlier I said, you can kind of build a raging network, kind of like assembling a model out of Legos. You can use our pieces or our breadcrumbs in the area that's most applicable based on capacity and data rate needs that you have. So a person who's, uh, you know, walking around a dismounted worker, if you will, probably doesn't have the same uh, data requirement that one of these giant haul trucks with all the sensors and cameras and whatnot has um, and may not and those may not have the same capacity as one of the towers that's tied in with the organization's LAN. Um, so you can fit an appropriate device to each different element that you want connectivity to, to ensure that you end up with the uh, adequate um, throughput for your needs, but you're not overspending um, for the equipment. So these different models, I just, if I could interject here real quick, the, the, the models that you're referring to, uh, we have uh, several different flavors of breadcrumbs. Uh, these particular ones shown uh, that we use in mining and, and some of the more rugged 
uh, we use our FE1 platform, that is the, uh, the, 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 Peregrine, the Peregrine, Redcrumb, and the Hawk. Uh, both of these are hardened, uh, mil-spec designed. They're, they're made to be outside. They're made to be shocked and vibrated and uh, rugged, very rugged conditions. As you can imagine, mining is an extremely rugged um, environment for you know, electronics. Um, so uh, the Peregrine is a four radio device um, that will do two by two MIMO. Um, it also will do some LTE. Um, and then our Hawk is a two radio uh, device um, that'll do two two by two MIMO uh, or support two two by two radios. Um, and then of course, we've got the man wearable stuff that you see on there. That's a single, that would be a single radio, but as Todd's point, they don't have the same data requirements and things like that that uh, some of these other devices would use. But um, I don't know, we can plug the website, but uh, you know, uh, Ragent.com, We've got lots of uh, we've got lots of different um, devices that would suit a lot of uh, a lot of different needs. So if you had a supervisor with a tablet out there doing his job, he's not going to be having thousands of IO points going back, but he still right. need to be connected to the system. He may be inspecting, he may be uh, doing some data collection, doing some observing. So you even have a a radio that's small enough for a person to use with a mobile device. A, a specific example in that, if you look on that picture, and I'm sorry for your your uh, audio only <laughs> listeners, but imagine a surveyor. Uh, you see them all the time outside. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they're surveying. They survey the land just like we have, you know, out in, you know, the cities and 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 in the the suburbs, uh, where surveyors come out and they survey the land. Um, uh, you know, the uh, the mining engineers have you know have the need to go out and survey the land. So you might have a dismounted worker, you know, with a survey pole with a radio, with a single radio or something like that. So let me pick back up here. Um, you brought up a point about somebody out in the field with a tablet that needed Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, within the picture here, the people that are standing are quite a large distance away from any network infrastructure. Um, but because the nodes interconnect with one another, uh, they could have a small breadcrumb on their person uh, that could be interconnected to machines, and that node that is with them can also be enabled to act as a Wi-Fi access point. So they're effectively taking the access point with them in very remote areas, which gives them a reliable connection for their tablet, which by itself, the tablet doesn't have the communication power to be connected to uh, an infrastructure tower that might be, you know, two or three miles away from where they happen to be standing at that point in time. You know, I want to ask too, is there any data segregation? So I see that a lot of these devices, like you just said, have the capability to be to have Wi-Fi, right? Is there any concern or data segregation that goes in that goes into the system to ensure that if somebody hacks in on the Wi-Fi side, they're not messing with the mission critical side how do you deal with that do you want to talk about vlan steven yeah so uh we are um 802.1q compliant so uh you're able to trunk um vlans uh, across the network so each one of those mesh and it, the, the the beautiful thing is uh, each one of those mesh links passes all the traffic um we do have the ability to kind of to to segregate data per mesh link that's one of the capabilities that we do have um, but, uh, you know, if somebody were to somehow get in wirelessly, um, they would not be privy to all of the data, uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's moving around on those mesh links. Maybe to say it a different way, the VLANs segregate traffic, different types of traffic from one another, both for security as well as for quality of service, because we're able to assign prioritization to different VLANs that are carrying mission critical data, for example, we can give that mission critical data higher priority than low priority data. And that way you have one network that can run many applications, but is providing a quality of service adequate for each application on its own. Makes sense. All right. Well, let's, let's hop into a, a similar but slightly different application which would be a heavy construction environment. So, you know, we all enjoy driving down quality highways. Um, 
I happen to live out in the West where we have great distances between cities of hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, and little known fact, there is not LTE coverage everywhere you go in this great country of ours. Um, and so if you need uh, connectivity, then you need to put up a private network to provide that. And this is just another similar diagram of a remote construction site where uh, temporary buildings, equipment, vehicles, and people are interconnected uh, utilizing our breadcrumb nodes. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people who live in the city don't understand that. I actually uh, I live out here in the in the uh, Appalachia, in the uh, Adirondacks, Berkshires, you know, and, and there's, you just, you can drive five minutes in any direction and lose signal. So, um, and depending on what carrier you have, depends on where you lose it. So I think out, out in our neck of the woods, like out in your neck of the woods, this is something we live with on a regular basis. But, sure. um, and then sometimes we purposely drive through those areas if we want to get off the phone. But um, I, I, there is a large percentage of the population, especially the younger population, who, who don't, don't, haven't been living in those dead zones. And uh, that's a real fact. And you bring up a good point when you live in an environment where there's a lot of um, physical obstruction due to geography yeah. um, that prevent those long range transmissions like LTE signals from getting down into the haulers between the hills mm -hmm. um, and, and don't allow you to communicate. A breadcrumb network is extremely flexible in that you can expand and scale the network simply by putting out another node with power. And as long as it has line of sight to one or more nodes, it will extend the network uh, out to and beyond where it's located. And so you can, for example, if this construction job was winding through the hills, the Appalachians or Adirondacks, um, you could line the road with breadcrumbs to extend the network along the winding road. Whereas if you're relying on a cell tower that's built several miles away, uh, the signal doesn't go through the mountain. Signal won't go through the hill and penetrate that. So if you drive around behind a hill and lose sight of the tower, you lose connectivity. When you're doing large commercial work, where your work is dependent upon having and maintaining connectivity, then you need to use an adaptable network topology that enables you to uh, lay out the network such that you can maintain critical communications at all times. Um, this was kind of the last use case I wanted to show. This is a diagram of a warehouse. There's racking with high density uh, storage on the on the racking. There's uh, robots. There's uh, forklifts and material handlers moving around. There's even some indoor drones and dismounted workers. And everything's interconnected, utilizing uh, the breadcrumb network. Um, and so I would, I would guess I would say for your listeners and your users that are trying to wrap their head around um, our technology, the big takeaway I'd hope they would gain is that you can utilize breadcrumbs to put out and have network coverage in virtually any environment. Um, such that you'll have mission critical communications that you can rely on um, due to physical obstruction, due to electronic interference. Um, we can handle high capacity. Uh, we're, we're the guys people call when they've tried everything else and nothing else works reliably. I got a comment. Those are the meanest okay. looking AMRs. I've ever seen with uh, with cobots installed on them. <laughs> they almost <laughs> they almost look like like uh, military AMRs there. But yeah, uh, those that, are I, there's some large ones. Um, in the next dial, there's some small black AGBs uh, yeah. that are just moving a box or two around. So you know, and again, we're trying to illustrate the adaptability of the network 
you know, whether the device is large, small, in the air, on the ground, um, it's a very adaptable platform that we can integrate with virtually anything. I'm going to turn this over to Stephen. So um, thank you, Todd. Uh, so um, one of the things we kind of wanted to drive home is the how we're how we're different. You know, our key differentiators um, between what Ragent does and what your traditional wireless network does. So this slide depicted here um, is your basic um, Wi-Fi. Um, you know what they call a, a, a Wi-Fi mesh. So each one of those yellow dots that uh, that you can see there will, would represent a, um, a hotspot or an access point. Um, now, what makes that a air quotes mesh is the fact that those access points can talk to each other on a different frequency. So you have one frequency that is servicing, you know, multiple clients, and then you have one frequency. Uh, to connect all of the the uh, the nodes or the the um, uh, the hotspots together, which what is what they consider a, a, a mesh. Um, so the the key thing to take away from this is what if you lose one of those yellow dots? Um, if you if you were to to lose one of those yellow dots, all of those clients connected would be starving for. They wouldn't be able to offload their data. They wouldn't be able to receive data. They'd be out in the dark. So, and I will say, um, I'll draw this a parallel here. Um, uh, in your average LTE network, it's the same thing. If um, you know, if you're if you have a tower or a cow go down for whatever reason, you know, power or damage or, or whatever. Uh, but if one of those goes down, you know, if you don't have a if you don't have a cell phone tower, your cell phones don't work, right? So um, that's kind of one of the same limiting factors on top of the fact that you have one access point that's servicing multiple clients. So, um, you know, if you have a lot of clients, either all your clients are going to have very, very slow data rates, just based on the amount of time. I mean, it's a physics problem, right? So uh, they're going to have very li a limited amount of capacity uh, to move data, um, or you're going to have to build in a tremendous amount of density to that network so that each one of those access points can service multiple clients. And I keep coming back to that switching time. Like if you're walking around with your cell phone or your laptop or your tablet and you're watching a video, who cares? It buffers so many frames ahead of you. So if you switch between access point one and two, you're not even going to notice. And, um, you know, if you're working on an online document, you're probably not walking around or you're sitting down. So you're not going to ever know what would happen if you lost connection there for even a couple of seconds but in the automation world we know that that could that can be that can be that can mean that the amr goes in the wrong position or takes the wrong order or you lose some vital data during a critical moment so that's i, that, I keep coming back to that too as being another important part to add to everything you just said Stephen. and let me turn it back to you yeah, just um, just to kind of emphasize that point a little bit, when uh, we've worked with some customers that are using robots in in warehousing and in um, uh, manufacturing, and um, they the the robot doesn't go in a wrong direction, the robot stops, and the robot stops until somebody zone. physically until somebody physically goes out there and verifies and validates that all is safe for that robot to continue working, and then has to manually interact with it uh, in order to get it going again. And that happens, you know, in mining automation. That happens in in uh, manufacturing and warehousing automation. So, lack of connectivity or dead spots um, really do mean that um, it, you know cost them money. So that's uh, one of the like, again the ROI on these networks are you know they pay for themselves very very quickly. It's a great example. So um, it, just to to kind of illustrate what we're talking about when it comes to um, our InstaMesh protocol, you, Todd brought up before. Um, we have a multi, we use a multi-radio approach and by multi-radio, I mean, in, in the same breadcrumb, in the same node, we have multiple radios um, and each one of those radios connect to each other on multiple, um, on each one of those frequencies. So, you know, in this case, we've got a 2.4 and a five gig um, radio embedded in these devices. And so we have multiple frequencies and uh, we have multiple frequencies at work moving data down both channels. And in this particular slide, uh, we're demonstrating the fact that if we have 2.4 interference, which is not very common, right? Just imagine, if you will, if you were using, if you were, you know, 
in a in a in a in an environment with a jammed up 2.4 or 5 gigahertz uh, spectrum, you have the other spectrum to move your data. So um, that's the way that we mitigate uh, localized interference in a lot of cases. Because even though it's uh, you know in this case 5 gig is interfering, some of those nodes might not see that same interference, so they can still use their 5 gig and uh, still move their data to the to the source on 2.4. In that same network topology that we used that we were looking at before with um, just the single uh, hotspot, you know, the yellow dots would represent, you know, um, ESSID squawking hotspots. Um, now, all of those different clients that were depicted before are all talking to each other, um, as well as talking to um, the, uh, the hotspot or the access point. Now, imagine if you will, that same um, that same access point going away. If that yellow dot goes away, you still have connectivity among the machines. And at least one or two of those machines are going to have good connectivity back to another infrastructure node. And that's kind of that's that's the key is um, deploying your network in such a way that um, first of all, each one of your, your infrastructure nodes is well connected to each other. But then um, you know, if you have an infrastructure node go down, we know that all of your mobile assets are able to move data through themselves back to an infrastructure point. Um, and we constantly maintain that connectivity as mobile assets move through. So we don't have that handoff problem because they're already connected, if that makes any sense. No, it makes a lot of sense too. And I'm thinking about uh, some IP cameras I installed recently. And, um, you know, the 2.4 gigahertz, you, you know, it may be slower than the 5.8 gigahertz, but what a great fail back because they're, get longer range, they're less susceptible to noise because they're running slower. So by having, hey, you want everything to be 5.8 gigs, but if something goes wrong with that, you can fall back and you, now you can reach even more. And I'm uh, part, part of this, I'm saying this is because I know the audio audience can't see the beautiful slides we're looking at, but it's a, it's a, it's a, I have to say, I think it's a great design because it allows the fallback because you can reach so many more uh, nodes with the 2.4 gigahertz just because of the range it can make. You know, it's so far greater than the 5.8. So I can definitely see the, the genius here in this design. You know, in practice, where you have this distributed network where each of these nodes is running our InstaMesh firmware, the each node is continuously monitoring the quality of every one of these many different connections it has. And then sending traffic across the very best link at any moment in time, you effectively have created a network that is almost like a living network because it's effectively self-optimizing. Um, every other network out there in the world, yes, it'll transmit data, but they have static configurations and they operate exactly the same all the time. They don't operate dynamically. They never are able to optimize. And that's really what you get with Ragent is this dynamic self-optimizing network that's working for you as well as moving your data so that you have the highest level of performance that's very, very consistent all the time, whether you're inside, outside, or wherever. That's, um, you know, Todd brings up a really good point. Um, when, when I when I do, because we do a lot of training and teaching of our customers and stuff like that, one of the things that I always bring up is the fact that, um, you know, each one of these nodes is capable of, capable of routing. So from the guy on, from the, the small little radio on the, on the, you know, the man wearable to the machine, to the infrastructure, each one is capable of making independent routing decisions. And they're doing that because they're looking at um, it, it's what's embedded in our pr 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 proprietary protocol as a means for those radios to grade and monitor, you know, how well those mesh those mesh links are performing in real time. So it can grade them and say, yep, I can go this way or nope, not so good. I can go this way. And, um, you know, when Todd talks about optimization, the radios do that on their own. The radios have, you know, the, the, the routing tables in these radios are dynamic all the time and they're updating their routes hundreds of times a second. So um, it's a very, very powerful protocol. Um, and it is it is like, uh, you know, when you deploy these things out there, it does become kind of like a living, breathing, living network. 
because it just works. They mesh right out of the box and they just keep on going. I mean, they're very, very configurable. You know, you can get uh, you can get as sick and twisted as you want to when it comes to security, um, networking protocols. We have the 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 way we have ways to, you know, uh, set up a gateway, let the radios do their own, uh, handle their own DHCP addresses. Um, we can we can support port forwarding. I mean, like I said, there's they're very 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 configurable. But all that aside, they're also you know this network is the easiest deployable network out there today because they literally just come up and mesh right out of the box before you even touch them. One other thing I just briefly mentioned that I think is relative, relevant to your audience um, is that not only can we transmit IP data, we can transmit UDP data, and we also support Modbus data or serial data. Um, and you can do all of that over the same network. Oh yeah, Profilink, uh, uh, Precision Timing Protocol, we support all of that stuff. That's pretty much what we prepared to share. Well, I appreciate you both, Todd and Stephen, for coming on and talking to us about this. I guess the only final question I would have is, let's say one of our listeners that doing a control system and it's a challenging wireless environment, and they want to know more about your company and about, you know, you may possibly using it in an application. Where would you direct them? Who would they reach out to to find out more? Do you, is it a website? Is there a phone number? I would I would say the easiest way is to visit our website, www.ragent.com. Ragent is spelled R-A-J-A-N-T.com. And uh, we've got a little uh, robot on the homepage you can engage with and ask questions and Drop in a note if you'd like to be contacted, and we'll do our best to get back with you and answer all your specific questions about your unique applications in a timely manner. All right. I really appreciate that. Again, Todd and Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the Automation Podcast. Thanks for having us, Sean. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And I want to thank Stephen and Todd for coming on the show to talk to us about their mesh networking products. Very interesting stuff. I really enjoyed this episode. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a like and a sub and a share. It really helps us grow the audience and find new vendors to come on the show. Also, if you want to follow me, you can do so over at automation.locals.com. And if you want to check out some of my training courses, you can do so over at theautomationschool.com. With that said, I want to wish you all a courageous, fearless, and awesome week. And until next time, my friends, peace.